Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody's smiling face, and you too. So we want to welcome all those who are joining us online. We're so glad that you joined us. GT Church is a place where you can find the life-giving message of Jesus Christ, and that message gives us hope and fills us with joy. Isn't that great? We love the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm excited today. I'm excited for what God has for us, what he's doing in us, what he's doing through us. The fall has started, even though it snowed yesterday. Thank you, Tammy Tad. Not ready for snow yet. I'm going to be honest with you. Not ready. But, um, you know, God's in control. Maybe. No, he is. He's in control. And so... uh, We just have had a great start to our fall already. We've had two conferences. We usually don't try to stack them so close together, but that's just how it happened this year. We had our Holy Spirit conference, and then we had our healing conference, and they were just powerful, jam-packed. They were awesome. If you missed that, you can go to our YouTube page and catch some of those online, and it was just so great. The reason why we have conferences, the reason why we study the Word of God, the reason why we have these things so is so that we can be refreshed and we can be filled and we can be filled with the knowledge of God so that we can take this knowledge to our neighborhoods. We have these conferences so that when we have our neighborhood light the night, we have something to give out. We're going to give out candy, we're going to give out smiles, but we're also going to give out the presence of Jesus because he lives in us and it's just going to happen, right? And so these conferences help us prepare for that, to love Jesus, to love our neighbors, to love people with the power of Jesus Christ. It's so awesome. Today, we are beginning a new sermon series entitled Stories Jesus Told. Stories Jesus Told. And we'll be going through some of the stories, the parables of Jesus over the next six weeks And we'll see how Jesus uses this method of teaching to convey life-giving truth. Uh, Jesus loved telling stories. In fact, people have called him the master storyteller. He loved this this form so much that uh, uh, at least a third of all the recordings Uh, words of Jesus that we have, we're in story form. We're in this parable form. And so we're going, because he uses it so much, we want to look at it. We want to spend some time looking at the stories of Jesus, what he's telling, what he is wanting us to do. And so um, we're going to have this series over the next six weeks. So um, the obvious first question, if you're taking notes, is what's a parable? What is a parable? If you're taking notes, a parable is a fictitious, made-up story designed to teach a lesson through comparison. It's a made-up story designed to teach a lesson through comparison. And it conveys a message through an analogy, through comparing and contrasting. The distinction between a parable and a fable is that parables are true to life. They use true to life things, everyday things. There's no talking trees or talking animals in, in a parable. Those, those would be a fable. But a parable uses real life illustrations so we can say, oh, I can identify with that. Oh, I can see how that applies here. And so Jesus uses everyday things, objects, life lessons in his story to convey and to teach us truth. And so uh, the next question is, so why did Jesus use them? If you're taking notes, he used them to illustrate his point. If somebody was asking him a question or if he was driving home a point, he would tell a story to illustrate, for example, of what he was trying to convey, what he was trying to tell somebody. He would tell a story to help explain it, to illustrate it, and to drive that point home. And then the second reason he would, how he would use them is he would use them to speak truth indirectly. He would indirectly speak truth. He would share a harsh truth through, and he would use a story to do it. The nature of a parable is that the story and the characters need to be interpreted. And so he would use these so that people could discover 
truth and then apply it when they're thinking of the story. If you just tell somebody they stink, that's a little offensive. But if you tell a story of somebody who stinks, <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit better way to go it. So instead of Jesus saying, you stink, he would tell a story of somebody who needed a bath or something like that. All right? And so um, in that, you could either say, oh, that story applies to me. You know, that story applies to me. Or you can say, that can't, hard, how could that apply to me? And so um, Jesus would use stories to help people discover truth. And when people discover truth, they're more likely to follow it than if somebody just tells them truth. And so Jesus is bringing the mirror of truth in story form so that when people are like, I wonder what it means when he said this. Oh, it's, it's like that. That thing that I do is like the thing that they did. And like, oh, 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 that applies to me. That's, that's me. And so uh, there's two kinds of people. There's the people who would allow the story to speak into their lives. And the other kind of person who would say, well, that story is for them and it's not for me. And they would just go on their merry way. And that leads us to the third thing that Jesus would use a parable for is to separate those who cared from those who didn't. To separate from those who were just trying to get self-service from Jesus but didn't want to follow him. Those who heard of his great miracles and of his power and came just for themselves to be healed or other things, but not necessarily change their lives, not necessarily do what he wanted or change their lifestyle, but they just wanted something for themselves. And so Jesus would use a story to tell truth to the masses, and those who were looking for it, those who were striving for it, would say, ah, ah, that's what he means, that's what he means. And if they didn't know what it means, they would go, and they would say, Jesus, what do you mean by this? And he'd say, ah, for you, for you, it's meant for, so that I can tell you and explain it to you. But those who just listen and say, and say well, I don't understand. I'm giving up. I'm going my own way. That's for somebody else or whatever. That's, it's so that they can hear and that when they stand before God, they can be judged of having heard the truth but not apply it to your life. But you, you have come and you searched out truth and you've come and you said, what does this mean to you? I'm giving the answer. Jesus used parables to separate people out. He uses them to see if people are really for him or just for the goodies. Same is true today. Jesus uses parables to separate people. Are you just in it for the goodies? Are you in it for him? Jesus is uses what benefit do they have today? If you're taking notes, they cause us to dig deeper into the teachings of Jesus. They still offer questions and they still confound us sometimes and say, what does it mean when he said this? And it causes us to stop and say, what did Jesus mean? And we dig a little deeper. And when the Holy Spirit sees us dig a little deeper, he says, ah, to you, I'm going to give the interpretation. I'm going to allow you to find truth. So with the, these ideas of parables in mind, let's look at our story for today. And it is the story of the wedding banquet. Now let me set the stage for you here. Jesus is telling this parable in the temple in Jerusalem. The day before had been one of the most amazing days in the history of Jerusalem. It was Jesus' triumphal entry. Jesus came on a donkey, and the, the noise from the crowd could be heard from miles around. They were welcoming him in as the king, and they thought they were welcoming a king to an earthly kingdom, but Jesus was ushering in a spiritual kingdom. Seventy years earlier, Pompeius rode in on a white steed as a conqueror over Jerusalem. But here, Jesus is the peaceful king of Israel, and he rides in on the donkey. And the people scream, Hosanna, means save now, save us now. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so it's on the heels of this triumphal day that Jesus comes and he's in the temple. And the religious leaders, not just any religious leaders, but the high priest and the elders of the nation of Israel confront Jesus and say, what are you doing? The Romans are going to come and they're going to crush us. What are you doing? And they challenge his authority. And Jesus is telling stories to tell them of what they are doing. And they were rejecting Jesus' authority. And Jesus responds by telling this story. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. We'll look at that in just a moment, but let me give you some characters in the story. So as I read it, you can put it together as we go through it. The king is, there's a king in this story, and that king is God, and he's going to have a wedding feast for his son, and that son is Jesus, and he's going to send out, the king is going to send out invitations, and the invitations to those, to people, the, the, the invitees are the special guests, are the nation of Israel. And the invitation is the message of Jesus. The Messiah has come, that invitation to join what God is doing. And there's an army in the story, and the armies, the army in the story are the armies of the world. And there's servants in the story, and the servants in the story are the prophets, and they're the scriptures. And there's other invited guests. The second invited guests are the world. So with these characters in mind, Let's read the story. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed the murderers and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Isn't that a great story? He doesn't stop there. Jesus continues and he says, But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus told this story as a warning to the high priest and the elders. He told this to illustrate the tension that was in the kingdom of God and of the world. God wants his people to enjoy his treasures, but people were reluctant of how that was going to come about. If you're taking notes today, uh, there is going to be an invitation-only event. There's going to be an invitation-only event, and it is going to be amazing. This event, it represents heaven. This event, this invitation-only event is the joy of heaven, the treasures and the holy pleasures of God the Father lavishly giving in this celebration to give in this event to those 
who attend. It's going to be uh, an event like no other. It's going to be lavished like no other event. It's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, celebrating the marriage of his son, the wedding feast of the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and it is going to be off the chain. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. And so in this story, when people would hear that the king was throwing a party, they would know that only certain people could go. Not everybody could go. Only certain people can go. Only the special people. Only the royal people. Only people with the, the right last name. Only the pe people that had the means to go. Only the people that had the gifts to give the king could go. And so they would understand that this was an event that was exclusive. An exclusive event. And, and most of the people that Jesus was talking to would never be able to go to an event like that. They would just hear about it. They would hear rumors about it. They would hear the servants of the hall talk about how wonderful and how splendid it was and all the lavishness of the royal family on full display for all of their guests. And so when Jesus mentioned the wedding feast of a, the king's son, there was a vivid picture in their mind of this lavish, amazing event. But they could never fathom somebody not paying attention to the king. When the king gave an invitation, it was an honor. When the king allowed you to come into his presence, it was a deep honor. And th this story would have made people scratch their heads and say, how could somebody treat a king like this to, to be contemptible to the king to ignore his summons that they wouldn't understand that because uh, to ignore the king was to invite certain death, to invite judgment from the king. And here in the story, Jesus is saying, not only do they not care, they say, well, I'm going to go do something else. I'm, instead of being in the audience of the king and celebrating the king's son, I'm going to go work. It's, I'm going to go and and do business. I'm going to go tend my garden. I'm going to go do something else. And it, was, it, wasn't just, it wasn't just a rejection. It was an insult. They were insulting the king. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying that the people of Israel, they should have recognized the invitation of the king to welcome Messiah into the world. But instead of welcoming the Messiah, the one sent from God to rescue the country, the nation, the spiritual nation, they rejected him, not just once, but time after time. And the, those messengers, those servants that gave the invitation of the king were the prophets and were the scriptures. And they came and they implored them, come back to God. Come to God. What he has is amazing. What he has provided you is more than, you, more than enough, better than going to work, better than going over here. Come to the Lord. And some people just ignored him. Other people got mad and they killed them and they, and they killed the servants of the Lord the prophets, and God, the king, got upset. And he would not allow people to treat him that way. And so there is an invitation only event. Only the people who were invited were, were available to go. Only people who were allowed to who have received an invitation to come to heaven could go. And it wasn't an event where you could just go and slip somebody, uh, you know, if you go to heaven and everybody's there and, and you're in line and you try to skip the line and you, maybe you don't have a reservation, you can't just go up to St. Peter and slip him a hundo and say, hey, can I get in? You know, it's an invitation only event. Heaven is an exclusive place. And so the, the rulers of Israel were rejecting God, were rejecting his way. And so if you're taking notes, those invited must RSVP. In the story, the people, they didn't respond. They didn't respond to God. They didn't RSVP. They didn't uh, pay attention to what God was wanting them to do. They didn't take the king very seriously. They showed super contempt against the king. They became, the king was so gracious 
and so kind to his people that this is my reading of the text, that they were, they were filled with their own self-worth and didn't realize that it was the king that gave them place and honor and not them themselves. The king loved them so much and was so gracious to them and loved them so great that they began to take the king's love and replace it with their own selfish desire and say, well, I don't have to respond to the king because I'm as good as the king. And they didn't realize it was the king that gave them place and honor. So they mistreated their servants and they killed them. And this is exactly what the nation of Israel did to God and his prophets. So in the story, the king removed them from their place of honor. The king did not and will not put up with rebellion. Sometimes we focus so much on the grace and the mercy of God that we forget how to treat the king. So much of our message is focused on the love of God, rightly so. How awesome is that? The love of God. He accepts us where we are. He loves us so much that we forget, we forget the worth of the king and that the king will not put up with rebellion. No matter who you are or how important you think you are, the Lord will not put up with rebellion. So the message of this first part of the story is to the to uh, the religious and to the nation of Israel, and we could even apply it today to Christians who are so self-consumed that we don't hear the voice of God. And when we hear it, we say, well, that doesn't apply to me because Jesus loves me. God couldn't be calling me to that or God couldn't be expecting that out of me because he knows I struggle in that area. And so because he loves me, he's just going to let me let me be. If we continue in that attitude, that attitude from taking advantage of God's grace is going to be moved from uh, applying God's grace to our lives to rebellion. To saying, well, God doesn't require that of me, friend. We, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. Sometimes we make the gospel all about us. Friends, it's not all about us. It's about him. It's about who he is and what he makes available. Sometimes we forget that we are rotten sinners that deserve just punishment in hell. There's not one person in here within the sound of my voice or in all of the world that doesn't deserve hell. You say, well, that's kind of harsh. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> but that's what the Bible says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And sometimes it, we lose sight of where we've come from. And we pl place our worth, God's worth of us, as something that's entitled that we are entitled to God's grace, that we are entitled to his mercy. Friends, Romans chapter 2, verse 6, that it says, don't you know that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance, not my entitlement that leads to forgiveness, but God's kindness that leads us to forgiveness. And the nation of Israel had all but forgot they, what God had done for them, their history of redemption, of, of God speaking to Abraham, a single man, and out of that single man making a nation, and that nation going to Egypt, and God growing that nation, and they becoming enslaved in the nation of, of, of Egypt, and God bringing them out by a mighty hand, and bringing them into a promised land, flowing with milk and honey, and then his grace and his mercy was on them, and they promised a deliverer. He promised the Messiah to come, to open the eyes of the blind, to raise the dead, to do miracles miracles, to make the lame walk and the, the dumb to talk. And they forgot that it wasn't them, it was God. In our self-serving culture today, sometimes we are in danger of believing that it's us and not God. That it's us that, that God, that deserves God's 
attention instead of God deserving our attention. That we need to follow God and worship God. And this story is showing how the nation of Israel had reversed their role. Uh, The king is allowed to ignore an invitation. The servants are not allowed to ignore an invitation. When the king speaks, we go. And so the... So in the story, God, the king, removes the people, and he says that they are not worthy of being invited to the wedding feast anymore because of the way that they treated him, the way that they've, they acted towards his servants. And so now he's changed the invitation. So if you're taking notes, there's an open invitation to all. There's an open invitation to all. Verse 8 uh, through 10 says, Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and to invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered uh, gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. There's an open invitation today. Anyone can come, but... Anyone can come. Anyone can, whosoever will can come. God ex- extends his wonderful heaven to all. If we accept his invitation, we can go to the party. We can go to this amazing party, the party that we shouldn't be able to go to, the heaven that we, shouldn't, that we don't deserve. We can go because now there's an invitation to everyone. Whosoever will, Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to be a, a Jew. You don't have to have a certain last name. You don't have to have money in your bank account. You don't have to have all this wealth and knowledge and, and all this. Things. All you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Isn't that awesome? So is, praise God. Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. But we have to accept his invitation. Everybody, there's an invitation, there's an open invitation, but you got to accept the invitation. And in the story, it implies that there's still some people that did not accept the king's invitation. There's still people on the outside that, that just think, well, that's not for me. And, and it's amazing that some people still stay outside and try to say what they have is better than what's inside. Ain't no way. <laughs> Ain't no way your raggedy little self is what you can provide is better than what's inside. We try to convince ourselves because uh, we, if we go, we got to conform to the king's standards, right? And we like, well... I'm not going to do that, so uh, what I have is better anyways. Ain't no way. What you can provide for yourself doesn't even compare to the crumbs that fall off the table in the king's banquet. There's an invitation to all, and you cannot compare your limited resources to what the king has and who he is, and he is good. He could be a king... uh, He would have all the rights to be a king who is oppressive, but he's not an oppressive king. He's a good king. He's a benevolent king. He shares his wealth. He shares his food. He shares his resources with his servants, with his kids, to all who come. He opens his abundance, and he helps them, and he blesses them, and whosoever will can come to the table. There's an invitation for you today. If you haven't received your invitation, you can take it today and you can receive salvation from the Lord. You can be changed. His grace and His mercy can be applied to you. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. From this day forward, you can be a child of God. You can receive the forgiveness of sins and you can go forward in the blessing and the power of God. Amen. There's an open invitation for those who will receive it in God's great kindness. He calls us. He calls us. It's an amazing thing that everywhere in the world, anybody who wants to, to leave their sin and to come into conformity with the king, they can come. They can come. And it would be wonderful. How great would the story be if it would stop there? 
if it was just that everybody can come. Woohoo! Yippee! Yippee! <laughs> everybody can come. But if you're taking notes, an open invitation does not change the standards of the king. An open invitation does not change the standards of the king. He's still the king. He's still holy. He's still just. He's still mighty. He still commands power and respect. He's still the God Almighty. And sometimes we take his immense mercy, his immense grace as lax on his standards. He's not lax. He hasn't changed. The invitation has changed, but he hasn't changed. And so here's the king in all of his splendor. And he comes, verse 11, but the king came and he took a look at the guests. He came to look at the guests to see who was there. He saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how'd you get in? How'd you get past the guards? How'd you get past the invitation? How could you get back past the warning? Didn't you feel a little funny walking in here like that? Have you ever been underdressed to a party before? <laughs> Have you ever been overdressed to a party before? Yeah. Don't you, there's a feeling that you get that something's not right. Something's a little off. You know, if you overdress for the guys, you know, you take off your tie and stuff it in your pocket, you know, and, uh, here, this guy somehow makes it past the, the, the people who are invited, who are dressed well. He makes it past the guards who are, are dressed well, guard the king. And all the trimmings and all the, all the things of the king's table is there. And everybody is, has put on their best. It might not be the most expensive, but it was their best. And they put on their best because it's the king. And the king requires a standard. The king requires us to do something for the king. Now, receiving the invitation is just by faith. We receive the invitation. We get the invitation. We get to go. If we accept the invitation, we accept the terms and conditions of standing before the king. If we accept the invitation, we say, yeah, I, I'm I'm, I'm going to conform. I'm going to conform to the standards of the king. I'm going to change so that I can stand before the king. I'm going to conform to his standards. Now, friends, I'm not suggesting a salvation by works. Not at all. What I am suggesting that is after we come to the Lord... We don't get to change the rules to make us feel comfortable. We don't get to change what he requires just because it, it's hard. We don't, get to change, we don't get to change the king because the, the, over, the invitations to all nationalities and all creeds, all lang- the invitation is open to everybody. But if we come to the king, we have to come his way and conform to his Standard. Too many times today, we try to change the gospel so that the invitation to go to more people. We try to change the standard so more people feel comfortable with standing before the king. And that was the problem. Somebody told this cat that he could come just however he wanted. Somebody told him Oh, you're fine the way you are. The king won't mind. That was a lie. Somebody said, now, anybody can ha- get an invitation. When you receive the invitation, you've got to let the invitation lift you up higher. Lift you up. Let the power of the gospel change you, lift you. But this person was resistant to the change that the gospel brought, that this invitation brought. He said, no, no, that's not for me. No, I've, I've got stuff in my past, and it brings up too, bad, too, too much memories, and oh, I'm not going to do that. 
Friends, if the king requires it, the king provides it. That's the thing about this kingdom. The kingdom of God, if the king requires it, the king provides it. So it wasn't that this, this guy couldn't afford it or that it wouldn't have been available to him or that somebody who gave him the invitation said, hey, buddy, let me give you some clothes. Let me help you. This is, not, this is not how you stand before the king. But somebody slept on the job. Somebody let him in. Somebody said it doesn't matter. But when he stood before the king, the creator of the universe, the God of all holiness, it mattered. It mattered. It would be nice if everybody would conform. It would not be nice if we could just come as we are because then that would be chaos and it would, it would be a kingdom of chaos. Why does the invitation matter? It's because there's safety in the invitation. He changes us to his standard, to conform to his standards so that we don't have to be afraid in the kingdom of God. We don't have to be afraid of, of hurt and shame. The king changes everything. His kingdom changes everything. Listen to the king. He says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Nobody stopped him. Nobody said, why are you dressed like that? Nobody said, let me help you change your clothes. Why is this important? Because it's not about you. We said before, it's not about you. It's about him. The kingdom of God is not to your liking. It's to his liking. God gives us everything we need, and he helps us. His church is supposed to help us. The inviters are supposed to help the people. It's not the inviters that set the standard of the kingdom. It's the king that sets the standard. And the king makes everything better. So Jesus is telling this story. He's saying, whosoever will, come. Come, come. Let the gospel change you. Let the love of God change you. Let my love change you. But you got to receive the invitation. And you got to let the invitation raise the standard. This is a chilling statement from Jesus. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are called. Many have heard the message. Few are chosen. Few count the cost and say, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, I, I care enough to dig into your word and find the meaning of these parables. Lord, I, I care enough to come and to find you. Lord, help me where I am. Help me where I am. So this morning, there's three areas that I want us to respond to in the story. So if you're a Christian today, have you traded sp spots with God? If you're a Christian today, have, have you traded the worth? Do you think that everything's about you and for you, or is everything about Him? Are you still able to hear His voice and obey it? Or when He speaks, do you say, well, I'm going to do something else? When He calls and invites you to something, you say, well, I'm busy that day. It's just Jesus. He'll understand. Friends, that's, those are dangerous words. God's calling us higher. He's calling us better. He's calling us into his love. Second area is uh, if there are people here today, you're not a believer. If you're not a follower of Jesus, friends, Jesus is calling. He's got an invitation for you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to go to the wedding feast. He's calling you. He wants you to come. He wants you to enjoy his heaven. Come to Jesus today. Third, third group of people is, th third challenge is, let the gospel change you. Let the gospel change you. Let what he requires wash over you and strengthen you. What he, the Bible says his commandments are not burdensome. They're not heavy. But they change us. It's not about you. It's about him. 
It's not about me being comfortable. It's about him getting glory. It's about the king. It's about the righteous king of the world, of the universe, of the cosmos. Christians, are we listening to the voice of God? Are we responding to the Lord? Or have we developed a calloused heart and we just don't respond anymore? Are we allowing our invitation to the gospel to distort the love of God? God wants everybody to come. He wants the gospel to be pure and give an uphold to people's lives. Can we bow our heads this morning? If you're here and you are not a follower of Jesus, you're not a believer in Jesus, but you want to follow Jesus today, you want to respond to the invitation of Jesus to come and live and come and be a part of his heaven. If, if that's you and you, you want to respond to Jesus today and you want to become a Christian and follow him, would you raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I want to, I want to follow Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hands. You can put it down. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I pray for those who've raised their hands. Lord, that you would come and love them and your power would come and change them, Lord, as they confess you, as they confess to following you, Lord Jesus, as they confess to conforming to your standards, to your way, Lord. So, God, I pray that you would guide these who've responded, those who've lifted their hands, Lord, and responded to your message, God, that they would follow you in Jesus' name. Praise God, you're here today, and you're a Christian, and maybe your heart has grown calloused to God. You've switched places with God, and you've become more important. Your, your agenda, your time, and your schedule has become more important than following and obeying the voice, voice of God. But you want to change that today. You want to say, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to hear your voice, and I want to follow you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? See your hands all over. You can put them down. Lord Jesus, you saw the hands that were raised today. Lord, we just confess that we need you. We need you to forgive us. We're wrong. Lord, we're wrong. We've taken your spot. And instead of you being in charge, Lord, we've been in charge. God, we want that to be reversed again. We want you to be king. Come and be king, Lord. Lord, would you remove the, the callous off of our heart so that we could hear the voice of God and we could respond to you, Lord. Lord, let us put you first in our lives. Let us allow you to be in control of what we do, where we go. God, we want you to be the Lord of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. The third group of people, if you would call yourself a Christian, but you have not let Jesus change your standards of living, that you've, you've allowed the gospel to be conformed to the way you want to live, not the way that the gospel calls you to live. But today, you want to change that. You want to conform to God's standards. You want to conform to the invitation, to the way of the king, the standard of the king. If that's you, would you raise your hand today? I want to conform to his standard all over. I see your hands. You can, you can put it down. Father, we pray that you would help us conform to your standard. And Lord, we know that everything you require, you give us. So, Lord, I pray that as we conform and things get tough, we pray that God the Holy Spirit would come and enable us to do that which we can't and that we would allow our lives to be conformed to the standards of the King, to the standards of the Lord. Father, we pray that we would walk in your holiness and we would walk in your standard. We would walk in your way. We would do what you want us to do, God. We want to follow your path and be faithful 
people of God. Because, Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. It's not about me. It's about you. So, God, we just ask for your help. And we know that you will give it. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Praise God. Friends, God's doing something in our lives. It's going to be great. When we conform to his standard, things are going to get good. The blessing and the power of God are going to be on us. And uh, things, lives are going to be changed because it's the message of Jesus that gives life, hope, and joy. Praise God. We stand and let me bless you. Now may the blessing of the Lord be upon you. May the grace and the mercy of God follow you. May the peace and the knowledge of Jesus give you joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Jesus I pray. Amen. God bless you. Go with God and he will go with you.